you, son. Of course, all of you sound great. Thank you. As always, the praise team adds so much of a dimension to our gathering time, and I know that they, they take it really seriously. It's serious about worship. It's serious about proclaiming the name of Jesus and praising him, and I know all of you are as well. That'll be a little bit of a theme we'll talk about today in our message, being serious about the Lord. We are uh, delving into, I introduced our series last week, and we're in the uh, Gospel of Luke. It says up there, make hope known. It'll be the third piece of our, of our purpose statement that's on all of your handouts that talks about live faith, love others, and declare hope. We're going to declare hope through the Word of God. Make hope known over the next 24 chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, it might take us a little while, so strap in. That's all right. We'll allow the Word of God to teach us, the Holy Spirit of God to teach us, and we'll go uh, line upon line and precept upon precept and let God's Word speak to us. Go to Luke 19. We're going to go there in a little while. I figured that if we start at Luke 19, we got five chapters, we'll be done in a couple of weeks. Just kidding. We're going to go back to chapter number one. We, we covered the first four verses of uh, chapter one, of course, last week as an introduction. Got some background on the, uh, the Grecian Dr. Luke and, and his background a little bit. Looked at the gospel a bit. Spoke of how between Luke's writing in the gospel and Luke's writing in the Acts of the Apostles, you combine them two together. And you have more verses that are attributed to the writing of Luke than you do of Paul the Apostle. So he is really, really regarded highly in theology, regarded doctrinally, regarded high, uh, strongly in what he puts out here and what he teaches us. Of course, it's by the Word of God, by God himself, by the Holy Spirit and how he teaches us. And, and I love Luke's personality in a lot of this you see that he is a medical doctor you can see that he has a lot of things that come through who in the world better to have uh, give an accounting of a birth of two people than of course the john the baptist birth uh, the pregnancy the birth and of course mary and jesus and and we'll get into even more of that today we'll be looking at john and how um, how the angel gabriel appeared to uh, zecharias the priest and and so we're going to be looking at that this morning. But again, going to the statement, declare hope, and looking at this gospel, uh, personifying and magnifying Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, we are to make hope known. He is our hope. In fact, our theme verse is up on the screen here. It says there in uh, Luke 19, verse number 10, for the Son of Man come. To seek and to save that which is lost. You are in Luke number 19. I pray that you will have found it already. I gave you a little bit of time. Let me read this and give you, I just want to read the 10 verses that are included here to go up to chapter number, I mean uh, verse number 10 of chapter 19 to say, hey, I, I'm glad that we landed here. I can see where God would land us here. It is to declare hope and to understand that we are to make hope known, Jesus Christ being our hope. It says in verse number 1 of chapter number 19, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, not to be confused with Zacharias. If I twist those two around today, that would be normal for Brownie, so that's okay. Um, that's okay, I know that you're enjoying my nice, raspy, outdoor voice, but uh, it's still working. And so God did not answer my wife's prayer. I can still talk. Here we go. But of course, it's very appropriate to Zechariah, who will lose his voice here at the end of our study today. It says in verse number two, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press. What a great statement. Of course, when we break into this in a number of months, there's so much good stuff here. He could not for the press because he was of little, statu little of stature. Verse 4. And he ran before, climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. He knew that Jesus was coming. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. You can obviously see so much about Jesus Christ. He did not ignore him. He was aware of him. He knew the crowd as so many times we have an accounting of Jesus Christ giving attention to someone who was seeking him. 
It says he sought him. What a great verse, of course, verse number two. We continue. Verse number six, and he made haste and came down and rejo- him, excuse me, received him joyfully. Verse seven, and when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. There's always the other side, isn't there? There's always the one that's going to bring reproach. There's always the one that's going to condemn. There's always the one that's going to criticize. Boy, that was a great VBSC, but can you please not say that? Well, I'm glad that he's seeking Jesus, but he's a rotten sinner. Those are the people that seek Jesus. The beauty of the, of the word of God is those people murmur and talk about Jesus being wrong as a guest with a man that's a sinner. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have taken anything from any man by accusation, I restore him fourfold. Remember what it says in verse number 2, this man Zacchaeus was the chief among the publicans, which means this man knew the word of God. He knew the Old Testament ways. He knew how to take care of things that were wrong, even so to the point where somehow, some way, there's conviction that's coming to his life to go find out who this Jesus is. And Jesus does that which we know he's going to do. Verse number 9 and 10, and we'll pray. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation. Come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham... For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We are to make Jesus, who is our hope, known. Join me in a word of prayer as we get into the Word of God in our study and our teaching time. Father in heaven, what a precious time we have to gather here this morning in the name of Jesus. I thank you. It's a fresh time. We've never done this moment ever before, nor will we do it ever again. And I pray by the name of Jesus that you will bring alive your word through the teaching by your Holy Spirit. I know it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I, I listen to children, 220, 30, 40, 50 kids, listen to them answer questions, Father, this past week of your word being taught by Pam and scripture memory verse by Brenda and Larry and all the different workers and servants, and I thank you because people respond when your word comes out. They may murmur, they may complain, but they may be just like Zacchaeus. That's who you are, God. You are a God of salvation. You are the God of salvation. And Jesus, you are the author and finisher of our faith. We like to tell you who you are because you deserve to hear who you are. So we tell you, you are glory, you are grace, you are love, you are forgiveness, you are goodness, you are just and you are righteous. And I thank you for your word, your living word right before us. I pray truly that you will teach us all, speak to us all, have us leave here in a little while taking you, God, more serious than when we came in. You're about serious business, and this is serious business, so I pray that you'll have your way, you'll have your will, and you will speak your truth as only you can, holy God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go to Psalm 89. I'll get there in a little bit. You see, when it says make hope known up there, Consider the setting right now historically. The people, the nation of Israel, have heard that God's going to send a prophet. That the Messiah is going to come. But they haven't heard anything for 400 years. And in this setting here in Luke chapter number 1, of course we advanced and went to 19 and talked of how Jesus come to seek and to save that which is lost. One of the reasons he came, but that's a pretty big one. And so when you grabbed a hold of that, and someone showed you that, and someone showed you that for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, 
For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When someone shows you scripture after scripture, when they said, when God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When someone declared hope to you, you said, wow, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. I was lost. Lost as lost could be. And people, thankfully, took the time to answer questions and came and said, I can tell you that you can have hope in Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven. You can have your sins washed away, the Bible teaches. Well, how can you know for sure? And this is the record that God has given to our life, and that life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. When you get saved, you have him and he has you, and he's not unlocking that. That is forever. And that you may know that you have eternal life and you may believe in the name of the Son of God. When people showed me these scriptures, it blew me away. As I was taught, he was clear. And to this day, it'll be 40 years just in a few weeks, I came to know Christ. And then Bobby started loving me a little bit more because I was, I was a lost reprobate. I was a lost man. We didn't know each other. Why would we? I watched his testimony, but I, I wouldn't. He's not coming to where I'm going, and I'm not going where he's going. After I get saved, he's put up with me for 40 years. So this morning, when you consider the setting of the Jews waiting to hear from God, it's been 400 years, they're losing hope. Consider their setting. Consider their lives. Consider that they think it's hopeless. All that's been told in the Old Testament. And God says, oh, I am faithful. I am faithful to bring you word. I will never break my covenant. I'll never break my oath. I'll never break my promise. So it says up on the screen very simply this. After 400 years of silence, God sent an angel to declare the fulfillment that he made in the covenant with David. You're in Psalm 89 with me? Psalm 89. It's an accounting of the covenant of David and God. God makes a covenant with, with David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 7. We preached and taught through it. If you went to our uh, institute course, we really broke it down a whole lot. Gosh, that's a few months ago, isn't it? But yeah, we preached through this a few, few uh, years ago. Think of what's being said here. God, in his infinite glory, in his incredible mercy, makes a covenant with David around, it's around 1000 BC, 980, somewhere around there, generally speaking. And he makes this covenant with the king. And he says in verse number 34, my covenant will I not break, not nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Wouldn't it be neat if we were like that? We ought to be. We need to be in that place where we war against the flesh so that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can put us in a place where we're like that, where we do not break a covenant. Verse 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. God saying, I did not and I will not break my oath. In fact, hundreds of years later, we have the counting in Matthew, we have the counting of Luke, of the genealogy, where it all lands back to David. The fulfillment of the covenant that God made, even though Jesus Christ is divinity, son of man and son of God. See, after 400 years of silence, God sent an angel to declare the fulfillment his covenant with David. He fulfilled the covenant by sending his only begotten son. Go back to Luke chapter number one. You see, God takes his promises seriously and he is often looking for those who take him seriously. Now we sit here for just a moment in our introduction to consider how serious we all are about God. Serious about his word. Serious about his faith. And our faith with him. 
Are you serious about his faithfulness in your life? Am I serious about his gospel that saves souls? Do I, am I serious about declaring hope? Do I take it serious to live faith, love others, and declare hope? God did make that covenant, and he came through. He does not break his promises. He does not break and go back on his oath. And he said his seed shall endure forever. And it is, and it will because of Jesus. God swore an oath to David that the descendants after him would point back to a holy God. God takes things serious. You hear me say that every once in a while. Well, today's message is all about that because God is really serious when he shows up with an angel on the, at the altar where Zechariah is in the temple. It says in the next slide, intervention by God into the lives of two people righteous before God because these are two people righteous before God it says so much it really does and we'll look at that even deeper think about these two people think of who they are they are righteous and not self-righteous like so many people that I run into that are religiously self-righteous they are so keen on proving to someone by the outward appearance but here you have an accounting of two people that kept the ordinances and the commandments of the Lord and it says that they were blameless again we'll get into that a little bit more this is serious for God bringing his word to you bringing his word to me sending his son the Lord Jesus Christ of course Mike just read 1 Corinthians 15 and read the gospel messages, a message right there in those verses. See, God will intervene into the lives of people that truly are in the place of righteousness for an assignment. And that's what we're going to end here. God has an assignment for some people. Maybe all of us, I heard, that we're all to go and preach and teach the gospel. But maybe you're looking and saying, I don't know, I'm not so much maybe as Zechariah, but I've been waiting for God to give me an assignment. Well, maybe through the word of God today, you'll see how God does it to supernaturally and clearly tell you what he'd have you to do. How often do we not take God seriously about his desire to fulfill his promises to us? How often do we not take God seriously? He has something serious for you and me. He has an assignment for you and for me. Generally speaking, his will for us is, of course, in everything to give thanks for. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's lots of those pieces. And one of the big ones is that we are to give the gospel to people. We are to be seed sowers. How is it that we're so good at looking at other people and whether or not they're fulfilling and carrying out by seriousness what God's called them to do, and yet we're not even looking in the mirror what God's wanting us to do? This man right here, Zechariah, is a priest who has an assignment in the temple. There's 24 of them. They cast lots or they have to do lots to see which one's going to do what. And you'll see here in the passage that he, he gets to handle the incense. This man knows about sacrifice. Now we know that Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice, right? He's the better. But this man is not righteous because of his own righteousness. His wife is not. Elizabeth is not. They're righteous because they put themselves before God and brought the sacrifices that they're supposed to bring to fulfill all that they're supposed to do until God says, I've got the final sacrifice you need is Jesus Christ. How often do we not take God seriously about his desire to fulfill his promises to us? Thus the title of our message today, Not Taken Seriously. 
I wasn't sure what to put in there, so I just put not taken seriously. Maybe the word of God in your life is not taken seriously. Maybe prayer is not taken seriously. Maybe your belief in God that can take care of everything is not serious. Maybe today, as we look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we see that they're serious, and then there's something wrong, and they're not so serious. And as I've heard preachers preach about this faithful priest who becomes not so faithful because of his fear, and then at the end of this little passage, you see that God's be so in favor on him, you go, wow, even though he shuts his mouth so he can't speak. So, what is it that you do not take serious? What is it that I don't take serious? So, I wonder if it's just God is not taken seriously. The Gospel of Luke tells us something here. And as you go to chapter number one, and we're going to read on, I want you to consider the Gospel of St. Luke as being this communication of God to us that we're going to study together as a church, that we can really get a deeper grasp of what it means to live the life that we're to live as being the sons of God and, of course, relating to the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our example. Let's see what the Gospel of Luke has for us. Again, looking at chapter number 1, verses 5 through 25. Sometimes I read the whole passage, sometimes I don't. Today, I'm just going to read a few verses that apply to our lesson point, and we'll walk it out that way as I've done a few times like that. Join me in verse number 5. Let's read the scripture and see what God has for us in our first supportive lesson point over not taken seriously. Verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, uh, Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. There's definitely some priestly, priestly lineage here. Verse 6, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they, were, they both were now well stricken in years. Now, just real quick, I just kind of, you know, how when you read the Bible and it just hits you sometimes, and you just look at those, both were now well stricken in years. For all of you that are old, you're stricken. I include myself. But we can't leave it independent of what it says. And they both were well, now well stricken in years. That means they're up there in age. I guess that's a nicer way to say it. Maybe not. I see the word stroke in there, and I'm not so sure I like that. <laughs> It's not there, but I just see it. So I don't want to be well stroken, I mean stricken. Our first lesson point off of these three verses is this. God often chooses specific people who have a blameless walk from taking their faith seriously. God often chooses specific people who have, bla have a blameless walk from taking their faith seriously. I'm going to bump this up a bit. <clears throat> Why hasn't God chose me to do such and, th such and such a thing? Why isn't God using me a certain, a certain way in such a thing? You know the simple principle. Jesus taught it. If you can't be trusted with little, how is he going to give you much and be trusted with much? But maybe you've decided on the other side that you're not going to take God seriously anyway. Maybe we're in a place in our lives where we're saying, well, if I get closer to the Lord and I have more faith, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Okay, we can relate that very simply. If I hear the word of God more and I get serious about it, then maybe God will ask me to do something. In fact, God will choose specific people. Here's a man named Zechariah. Here's a woman named Elizabeth. Well stricken. In their age, they don't have a kid. Think of the culture. It's a priestly guy, a priestly woman, the wife of a priest. And they are righteous, the Bible says. They're blameless. They're people that you look at as examples and they don't have a child. And culturally back then, people would say, wow, why would not God want to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth with these two people? 
That's how they were looked. They were looked at with reproach, as we'll see here. Is it the other side of things, again, for us as believers where, gosh, living that kind of life, righteous in Jesus, because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one, but then it says in Romans 4 that Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness so that he becomes righteous in God because of his faith, just like when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he made you righteous and he justified you. So now you and I are in a place where we're as, we are Zechariah's. So how is it that God would choose somebody and not choose another? Maybe God just wants to give a lot of people a lot of assignments and a lot of people are saying no to God. Now I can see by this list here the VBSC assignments for 2023 and there's over 60 people here. And the pastor that was overseeing it, Pastor Brian, along with his trust, trusty assistant, children's ministry director Pam Snow, went through and said, okay, we got to give people assignments. We've got to give things that people are to do to have the camp be successful. That's a small thing, but it's real and true, so it's important. But spiritually speaking, they're about to have the birth of the guy, prophet, who Jesus said there was none that all came before him were better than he is as a prophet. Jesus accounted for John that way. So I guess we could say he was uh, the best prophet of all time. And if you go to that passage when we get there, you'll see what Jesus says about you as a believer in accordance to John the Baptist. John is called out by God. So God often chooses. I didn't say always. I said often chooses specific people who have a blameless walk from taking their faith seriously. Is your faith, is your walk blameless? I want God to use me for something. Then walk like this in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Find out what his word says for you and for me. There's a lot of things he hates. There's a lot of things that he loves. There's a lot of things that he wants us to do. There's a lot of things he doesn't want us to do. There's some things he wants us to put on, and there's some things he wants to put off. But when we look at what Luke's gospel says, and what the word of God and the gospel saying, and then we look at what Jesus said you ought to do, please, God, forgive us for discounting what you want us to do, what you'd have us to do, because your desire is strong for us. To fulfill what you have for us that you would like to call us to do. This man is one of 24 priests. And they have their certain courses that they're to cover. And they're to serve in certain places. Over a two year period. And you find out that this man is serious about his following of the Lord. If you and I are serious about God, maybe, just maybe, we'd find out that God has a little something more for us. But will we be fearful that if he gave us something more to do, well, how about if we just let him decide instead of deciding for God? I'm standing here because God decided this. I did not decide this for myself. It's better that way, I promise you. And if God was to keep me, and this is it, this is the last message I ever preach. I'd be fine. Because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. And whatever he decides to do in choosing someone else at some other time, that's fine. You see, what you have, you're to steward while you have it, with all you've got to be serious about it. But when it's done, it's done. So why would you not put everything you've got into it? The it is the calling of God upon your life. Our second lesson point, we pick up in verse number 8, and we're going to read a little further down to 17. Hang on with me. Here we go. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of God. That's his assignment. Verse number 10, and it's one of many, many assignments. This is just a cherished assignment that one of the priests could have. 
They keep the labor, they keep the altar of incense, they keep all the showbread, everything. They've got so many beautiful assignments here, and they rotate them, they have to have the lots to do that. It's just an incredible, incredible, beautiful picture of who the high priest is when he fulfills everything. And then he makes you and I the, the ones to fulfill all of it now. It's incredible here. Verse number 10. The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So they know the incense is burning in the temple, and they know from the outside that it's happening, and it's a time of prayer. It's a good time to be praying. Verse number 11, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. You'd be scared too. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and, he, and fear fell upon him. I can't believe that he'd be fearful. I'd be. I'd be scared. Ah! What are you doing here? Don't forget, he's at the altar. There's incense. He's praying. Zechariah saw him. Zechariah and said, and he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel assured him. He said, verse number 13, fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Isn't that a great verse right there, verse 14? And he shall be great. It says that John says he's going to be great. Well, Jesus confirmed that he was. In the sight of the Lord, he shall drink neither wine nor shall drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall, be tur- shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, which is Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's going to go prepare. For the Lord to come. That's what you're going to receive as a son. That's pretty scary. Now consider before I read this. Lesson point. That they have been praying for years to have a child. And now the child that they're going to be given is this guy. Ah. It says up on the screen. God often chooses specific means to deliver his calling to those who have taken the word seriously. Now sit on that for a moment. I'm not saying that every one of you have to have Gabriel visit you. In fact, you don't need to since God can visit you right through the word of God all the time. How about a shepherd or minister or servant come to visit with you over the word of God? Maybe you have a brother or sister and you get together and pray and spend a couple hours in prayer. Maybe someone has a witness on your life by the Holy Spirit and by Scripture that says, hey, I see in your life this, this, and this. And maybe God's communicating to you through your prayer, through your time in the Word of God, through your time taking care of your family, with your time in vocationally working at wherever you work. And God's saying, I have a specific means to deliver my calling to you. But you need to take the Word of God seriously. We know that these two took it seriously to the point where they're praying. They're asking God for a child. (laughs) The angel knew what to say to them because God told the angel what to say. It says in verse 13, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John. I got you covered. I'm the messenger from God. I've come here to talk to you. I'm telling you in this particular specific means that this is the calling upon your life now. Well, I'm well stricken in age. Hey, you're going to get a kid. You're going to have a child here. And verse 14 just kind of sums it up. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Oh gosh, we're scared. We're filled with fear. We don't know what's going to happen. Luke's gospel is filled with statements about rejoicing and the joy. To be filled with joy. Luke believed in God bringing that joy. In fact, this calling out of Zechariah reminds us of so many other places. From Moses to David and on and on it goes. The New Testament was Saul who became Paul. All the disciples, the apostles, the acts of the apostles, 
all the different men, the different women, Aquila, Priscilla, the whole, the whole list. This man, Zacchaeus, he did become fearful. We see that. He was troubled and fear fell upon him. What would happen to you if an angel showed up while you as the priest were praying and bringing the incense to the place of sacrifice in the temple? Kind of like at home when you're praying and asking God for things and all of a sudden you're overcome with tears as he's speaking back to you about what he'd have for you to do, what he'd have for you to be, what he'd have for you as a special holy calling. How many of us have missed what God had called us to do? How many believers have missed the Zechariah's moment? Or they got the Zechariah's moment and they were so troubled and so filled with fear that they didn't believe that God would give them joy and that they would be rejoicing. Because all the other stuff ends up being more important and more serious to us than fulfilling what God put us on this earth for. Fear not is repeated, that statement Six, seven, eight times in Luke's gospel. God doesn't make mistakes. I didn't say he chose you for salvation. That's the wrong theology in the Bible. I'm talking about assignments. The VBSC assignments, those are small, but that's a picture. This assignment, Zechariah, all I want you to do is be dad. Just be a dad. Elizabeth, be a mom. Raise this boy right like you have walked being a righteous man. These two righteous people, unblameable. What a powerful, powerful calling. You mean just being called to be a dad or a mom for a child who becomes a missionary would be fulfilling? Oh, worth a trillion dollars. Right, Grandpa Larry? That a young man has decided that God called him and in certain funny ways, specifically, by God's way, he has said, hey, I, I'll go on a mission trip. I, I'll go on an internship. I'll go. I, I'll, I, I just go. Simple. Raise a good grandchild. I don't need to teach my grandchildren how to throw a baseball. I need to tell them and teach them how to love Jesus Christ. I don't need no more baseball players. There's plenty of them, and they all stink. I think they're playing for the Royals. I, I don't know. Or maybe the Oakland A's. What happened to them? Who likes Oakland? You like Oakland? You poor guy. You like suffering. If I take God seriously and his word, ooh, he might show up sometime in the word of God and tell me something I need to hear. Number three, verses 18 through 22, we'll move right along and be done. And Zechariah said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? Isn't it great that he has the same type of questions that Moses did? And you did? And I did? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Now real quick, this is just some marital advice real quick, men. Don't do that. <laughs> That's like saying, woman, don't, don't do that. Well, it's in the Bible. Nice try. He says that he's old but that his wife is well stricken. I don't know. God, God's tough. God's tough audience right there sometimes. You know what I mean? Yes, there's a moth flying around. Don't be distracted. I got a bigger mouth than him. Let's go. Keep on going. Strike him dead there, Lord. Yes, I said it. We have dominion over the creatures. Come on. Verse number 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel. What does Gabriel mean? Man of God. Got it? Oh, by the way, I didn't even give you that quick hint. Sorry. Ah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Zechariah's his name. Does anybody know what it means? God remembers. Ooh. And then Elizabeth's name, God's oath. Put them together. God remembered his oath. 
by coincidence. He says, I am Gabriel, man of God, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad things, glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that, thou, that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. They're thinking something really good's happened in the has. Verse 22. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them. He spoke, he beckoned, and nothing. He remained speechless. Nothing came out of his mouth. It says up there, the third lesson point, very simply, God often chooses to prove himself in someone who has questioned taking God seriously. Remember, this priest took him seriously before, but now he's questioning him. Maybe that's happened in your life. You're very serious. Take God serious. You still take him serious. Something happens, and you've been walking faithfully and doing that much, and then something happens, and God says this, this, and this, and you go, what, God? What, what? And you start questioning that's what it said back in verse number what, 13, 14, that he feared, fear fell upon him, he was troubled, and he was told, fear not. He, at, in verse number 18, Zechariah says, whereby shall I know this? How am I going to know this? I'm an old man, I'm stricken, my wife is stricken with years. How is it? And the angel answers him very clearly. He says, look. I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad things. Sometimes we close this Bible because we don't want to hear what God has to say, but this is the messenger right here. You don't need the angel. You got it right here. More than word, sure word of prophecy, I heard, than the audible voice of God. Peter wrote it. And since Peter happened to be in the presence of hearing the almighty God of the universe speaking, I guess... We got something there. And here's Luke telling us from the first three or four verses of the chapter that he's delivering what was delivered to him. That the people that have perfect understanding, he's passing it on. So that people can know the certainty of these things and this is how it went. So I give you an accounting. Because somebody gave him an accounting of what happened with the uh, angel Gabriel coming to visit him. God often chooses to prove himself in someone who has questioned taking God seriously. I'm too old. I can't do it. I'm running away from the opportunity, God. Well, how in the world did this happen when Zechariah was saying, please give me a son, 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 I pray, I pray, I pray, and then you, God says, here, here's your son. Oh, I don't want a son, I don't want a son, I don't want, whoa, whoa. Aren't we like that sometimes? We pray for something. We pray for our spouse to change, and then they change. And then we're upset because the spouse changed. We pray for our children to come back to the Lord. And then when we're doing that, oh gosh, now look at the burden I have to take care of them. We're confusing sometimes. We start questioning, and God says, I may choose to prove myself again and again and again to the person who questions now when they didn't question before. That happens in our lives a lot. We get close to the Lord, we're doing right, and then we go, wait a minute, did I make the wrong decision, God? God says, no, you didn't. Follow me. Are there some wrong decisions out there? Absolutely. But if you are as Zechariah, Zechariah and Elizabeth are, and it says that they obeyed the ordinances and commandments of God, they were righteous and they had a blameless testimony. When God spoke to them, I can see the doubt that they would have. I can see the doubt that he could have. 
But the word of God does not make a mistake. And when the word of God puts a seal upon something and carries his authority upon it, it is truly what God has declared for your life and for mine. God does not make a mistake. Period. And he'll use this beautiful book to show that to you every single time. It might take time. It might take some time. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to run away from God as much as it takes to run toward him. You have a choice. Lastly, we end with these last few verses. Chapter number 1, verses 23, 4, and 5. It came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Remember, he can't speak right now. He's beckoning, he's speechless. So he goes back to see his wife. All the people are seeing him at the temple. Verse 24, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. That tells you, and it's an accounting of a personal testimony that culturally man reproached her for not being pregnant. That she hid herself until she could be shown 20 weeks. Then the tummy. You're stricken with eight. God has done a miracle in my life. I'm pregnant with a guy that we're going to name John. John who? You don't have anybody in your house named that. The angel visited my husband. Well, let me talk to your husband. He can't. He's speechless. <laughs> Stop rejoicing in that, wives. You're wrong on that. Just kidding. You're right. We ought to be quiet. So here's our last lesson point. God often chooses to do the seemingly impossible to ensure man considers taking him seriously. Make hope known. The lost world that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, can you imagine when they witness something seemingly impossible in your life happen? It's supernatural. A child that's run away from God becomes comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior. The prodigal that ran away came home. There's no way. There's no way. You say, yes, God. Seemingly did something impossible. So that you can ensure that God gets the glory and that man would truly consider seriously who a holy God is. There's nothing like God doing stuff like that. There's nothing like it because he's the only explanation. We know the simplest definition of a miracle of God is that there's no, other exp no explanation on this earth. The explanation is from glory when something happens. He's the explanation. And that will cause somebody to say, I'm going to start taking God seriously. A lost person would go, I want to be saved. I want to have the Jesus that you know. I want to understand scripture like you do. See, God often chooses to do something that's impossible. To our minds, our eyes, our thoughts, our soulishness, our feelings. There's no way that could happen. And each one of us, if we look into our past, none of us are short of being a miracle in Jesus Christ by being saved. It's still the greatest miracle that I've ever witnessed. Is watching someone that I talked to about Jesus. And then they say, I want to pray and receive. And then two or three minutes later, <laughs> they're brand new. I, they're smiling for the first time. They're happy. I, I feel so different. It's like I don't have a burden on my heart anymore. I, I, I don't know how to talk. I... Don't forget, when that boy was born and they went to Zechariah, he got his ability to speak back. Name that boy John. Because the angel told me to tell you what to name him. 
God chooses to do seemingly impossible things that take the attention off of man and ensure man then considers that he's the one who needs to be taken seriously. Here's my statement at the end that you can turn into a question for prayer. Let's commit. Personally, collectively as a church, to take God seriously. More serious than you ever have. That he may accomplish his promises through his church. You say, I want him to accomplish his promises to me. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had a child. And that man, that little boy, he grew to be God's prophet. They didn't hold on to him. They let him go to the glory of God. Bow your heads for a word of prayer as we go into our time of invitation and prayer. Before I pray, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed and you're kind of in an attitude of prayer, just consider this. <coughs> When's the last time you took God seriously? I mean really seriously. Can you go back to your salvation and say, boy, I took him seriously then. And I'm so thankful for him saving my soul. That's awesome. How about your walk with him? Maybe it's time to maybe kick it up a notch when it comes to being serious about God. Lost person today, maybe you're lost, you've never called on the name of the Lord, you take God seriously sometimes or not, but I ask you to consider this simple Bible verse. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He will give you salvation by grace through faith. Our Father in heaven, thank you this morning for your word, for the beautiful example in Luke's gospel of your truth, of the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. Thank you <clears throat> for showing us what it means to be serious about you, God, because Zacharias <clears throat> and Elizabeth were serious about you. And the miraculous way in which you used them I'd love to see more of that. In the years that I have left, God, I pray by the name of Jesus and through the power of the word of God and the spirit of God, the gospel, that you will supernaturally do some things in people's lives. You will call them to another land. You would call them into ministry. You would just give them a simple assignment of being a children's ministry worker. I pray, Father, in this church that we would find it important to take you serious and then allow you to do things through this church to fulfill everything you've called us to do. Please, I pray, work in this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Please stand.